you to Jonna for beautiful playing. And I forgot to do our prayer at the beginning of the children's time, so we can do it now. You pray with me. Holy Spirit, bring us peace. Holy Spirit, bring us peace. Holy Spirit, bring us peace. Alleluia and amen. I'm Muriel Otto, your new pastoral intern. It's great to be with you guys. I get to be with you about once a month for about a year. So thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. So this reading today from Ephesians, Paul's preaching from prison. And to me, he sounds like, like, like a football coach at, of the underdog team at halftime, rallying the troops. Or do we have any Mary Poppins fans in the house? You know, the kind of fastidious and militant-minded father, the a life is a battle to be preached and fought. No, what is it? Life is a battle to be fought. So anyways, life is like this battle, right? And we get this imagery, he's like, you know, stand up and fight. Put on that armor. Be strong. You've got the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. And stand, stand, stand. And we're going to pray, pray, pray. It takes some serious machismo to make prayer sound like a battle cry. Am I right? Oh my gosh, this passage is enough to make any right-minded, hippy-dippy, pacifist Christians such as myself run screaming for the nearest yoga studio. <laughs> Don't run yet. God is still speaking. There is yet more grace and truth to break forth from God's holy word. Don't go in. Do any of you guys know the TV show Friends? It's my favorite TV show ever. And in the first episode of the first season, we meet spoiled little rich girl Rachel Green, who has just had a come-to-Jesus moment on her wedding day, realized this is not the life she wants for herself, and so she takes off. She's running through the streets of New York in her wedding dress, and she finds refuge in the apartment of high school friends Monica and Ross Geller. And there's a scene in that first episode episode and she is on the phone with her father trying to explain why she ran out on her wedding day so she's like come on daddy listen to me it's like it's like all my life everyone always told me you're a shoe you're a shoe you're a shoe you're a shoe and then today I was like what if I don't want to be a shoe what if I want to be a, a, a purse or 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 a hat no, I'm not saying I want you to buy me a hat. I'm saying I am a... It's a metaphor, Daddy! And Ross leans over to the others and says, You could see where he'd have trouble. So speaking of metaphors, okay, you're in the kitchen. You want to make something ambitious, delicious, above and beyond, and so you decide you are going to make the world's best gourmet, made-from-scratch lasagna bolognese. Now, if you're like me, you don't ever read the directions before you start, and you definitely don't check the ingredients list against what you actually have in the kitchen. You just wait in. So, you pull open the recipe. It's ten pages long. The secret, it says, is eight impossibly thin layers made with homemade pasta. Okay, you have no idea how to pronounce bolognese, and you've definitely never made pasta from scratch, but undaunted, you set aside your box of Borillo pre-cooked lasagna noodles, and you roll up your sleeves and you get to work. Okay, first comes the ragu, which, you learn, is a meat-based sauce which starts with a traditional mirepoix, whatever the heck that is, of carrots and celery and onions. You just happen to have all of those three vegetables. So, not only that, you find the cutting board, it's clean. The knives, they've just been sharpened. The carrots, have not even started to wilt yet in the refrigerator, and you even find that you have a bottle of essential oil of peppermint, which apparently stops your eyes from watering as you cut the onions. Okay, so you cut up all the vegetables, 
Now comes the time for the meat. Uh-oh, this recipe calls for not one, not two, but three different kinds of meat, one of which is pancetta, which apparently you can only get in Italian specialty stores, but you open the fridge and what do you know? You have all three, even the pancetta, and they are all already defrosted. Whoa! So you find that you have in the cupboard the perfect Dutch oven, which is specially designed for slow simmering such as this, so in it all goes and onto the stove. All right, now it's time for the bechamel with whole milk and butter. You don't drink whole milk, but hey, look, there it is in the fridge, and of course you have butter because everybody always has butter all the time, and some flour and a whisk and just the right size bowl, and <gasps> uh-oh. It calls for nutmeg. Nutmeg? Who would think that you would need nutmeg for a lasagna? Nutmeg, oh my gosh, but you pull open the spice drawer and <laughs> nutmeg in the very first row. So in goes the nutmeg and voila! You have, and I totally forgot the name of it, bechamel. Okay, you've got your bechamel now. All right, it's time for the pasta. For a minute you think you're sunk. But then your eye falls on this weird metal grinder looking thing on the counter. Turns out you are the proud owner of an authentic made in Italy pasta maker. Who knew? Of course, you have eggs and milk and flour and salt and a little olive oil. And soon, pasta is laying out to dry. You throw the dried pasta into a pot to boil and not one piece sticks to the bottom of your state-of-the-art pasta boiling pot. <laughs> Through the whole prep, everything goes like this. Nine by 13 pan? Got it. Food processor with pulse function? Yep. White wine? No problem. Parmesan? Got loads. It turns out that the eggs have already been warmed up to room temperature. Your ice cube trays are full of ice cubes for cooling the cooked pasta to prevent overcooking, and the oven has already been preheated to exactly 350 degrees. Amazing. So, you get all the ingredients together, you start to assemble your lasagna. One quarter cup of bechamel. One layer of homemade mix. Three quarter cups full of mix. Another half cup of the bechamel. Half cup of Parmesan. Okay, that's one layer. You do that seven more times until you have eight luscious layers of lasagna. You stick it into the oven. You even remember to stick a baking sheet underneath to catch all of the drips. And 50 to 60 minutes later, you are pouring, pulling out of the oven the world's best ever lasagna. Beautiful, browning, bubbling, and in plenty of time to cool properly before you eat it for dinner. The perfectly stocked kitchen. Anything the recipe calls for, you've got it. Such is the state of your spiritual kitchen if only you have the eyes to see it. I know it doesn't always feel that way. I can see where you have trouble. But it's true. God provides everything you need all the time. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. Daily bread, debts forgiven, life for all, grace, grace, grace. It is all grace. And it doesn't always feel that. You think cooking lasagna is hard? Try life. Try marriage. Try parenting, so I'm told. 
try trying to live like Jesus every day, trying to make it even a little bit more like heaven on earth, that is uphill work. I spend most of my life walking around feeling like we are, like I am, woefully inadequate for facing the pain and injustice in this world. My carrots always wilt in the fridge before I get around to using them. Halfway through any recipe, it's like, oh crap, where is some small child that I can bribe slash threaten into going to the store for nutmeg? I would never remember to stick a baking sheet under the lasagna. There's going to be burnt cheese all over the bottom of the oven. And there is no way I would ever wait any 45 minutes for a lasagna to cool before I dug into it. But most of all, there is no way I would ever dream that I could make a lasagna without those trusty Barilla pre-cooked pasta. I would not even dream of attempting it. But listen. Listen to the words of Ephesians that Christopher read. Listen to the words of Paul. God is still speaking and beyond and behind and between all of this talk of swords and breastplates and helmets. God is whispering to you and saying, Dream bigger. Give it a shot. Tie on that superhero follower of Jesus and step out there because I will provide for you. You might not have everything you want, but you will have everything you need, and most of the things you need aren't even things anyways, and I will provide for you. God is whispering to you, to your soul, saying, you will have enough. You are enough. You will have everything that you need because you are what I need to heal this broken world. And you are exactly what I need to make it heaven. Before we enter into a time of prayer, does anyone have any prayer requests, joys, or concerns to share today? We did get the sad news that Jan, tell me her last name again, sorry, Veldrum, Veldrum, Jan Veldrum had a stroke, but we did hear that it's a mild stroke, she's at the hospital in North Carolina, her kids are on their way. We said that we would send our prayers. Yeah, how far into recovery is she now? In two weeks? Let's bring hold Crystal in our prayers. There are Eva turned 99. Yeah. Cool. Congratulations, man. That's awesome. Definitely a prayer of joy. Thank you. John. For Mary and Eva. Welcome, Alan. We're so glad that you're here. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for a time of prayer. Mm-hmm. 